Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, he said, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the world, a word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Father, I pray you'd help us today. I pray that you'd help us to preach in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to feed the church of God that you purchased with your own blood. Pray you'd be uh, bless what we've been faithful to study. Bring it to our remembrance. God, I pray you turn the light on, help somebody see their need for the Savior today. Lord, I pray for that saint that's uh, getting weary and well doing. I pray for their uh, uh, just encouragement today. Pray for the saint, Lord, that's serving and that's excited today. I pray they'd receive something from the Word of God that would conform them to your image and help us, Lord, in this lost, dark world to be a light in the midst of this perverse and crooked world. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to try to preach this morning, if I could, out of this passage of Scripture on this thought of he is just like his father. You ever hear that? They say that boy is just like his daddy. And when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ in this passage of Scripture, it said God at different times and in different ways he spoke to us in the last days. Now, the last days has been running since uh, Jesus started preaching. And uh, it's going to be like it is until Jesus comes. I don't know, uh, Brother James Knox, a friend of mine, he said God kind of put a stop on the clock. You know, and these things that you see in the last days, uh, they're going to be happening until Jesus comes. Sometimes they're going to even be more prevalent than what they are. There's times when good and evil and light and darkness, you know, we beat them back and they beat us back. It's a warfare. But he said that he spoke to us in these uh, in past times under the fathers by the prophets, but he spoke to us through his Son, who is appointed heir of all things. And he said he is the brightness of his glory. Now, that means that Christ in that uh, he perfectly reflects the majesty of God. When he was here, he is the brightness of his glory. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, when God said, let there be light. Now, that was uh, long before the sun or the moon ever showed up. That was day 4. And so God is that light. That is the majesty that he's talking about. That's the same majesty that in Revelation 22, 5, when he said, they'll have no need of the sun... It'll be him that will brighten that place with his glory. That's what Jesus was. He was the exact, uh, perfect uh, reflection of the majesty of God. When he was on the, the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, and he, and he showed his deity to Peter, James, and John, I mean, uh, it was an amazing thing. They got to see what nobody else has seen, and they lived. And uh, they fell on their face, and Peter, just like sometimes you get in a real exciting meeting and you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Amen? Right. Just enjoy the moment because he said, look, we need to build here three temples. That's what Jesus Christ was. He was an exact uh, reflection of the majesty of God Almighty. In Revelation chapter 1, when he revealed himself in Revelation chapter 1 as he was, he talked about his glory. And His majesty, that's who He was. He's the same God in John chapter 1. and verse 9, He said He lights every man that comes into the world. Amen? Look here, that light, when I pray that the light gets turned on, sometimes uh, it, it, just, it, it ain't every day that that light comes on. And, uh, you know, our Calvinist friends, and I do have friends that are Calvinists, and I tell him he lights every man. There's a place and a time, if you want to call it, you're going to have a Damascus Road experience when God's light is turned on, you're going to see your need for him. 
And uh, Jesus Christ is that one that lights every man. But he talks about him being the express image. That means he's an exact uh, expression of any person or anything marked likeness, a precise reproduction in every respect. That's who he is. That's who we're talking about today. That is a centerpiece. And when Jordan was teaching Sunday school, he's a centerpiece of what we're doing. I like your pastor. I, I like this time of year. Everybody talks about Jesus, good or bad. Uh, love him or hate him, they're talking about him, and that's a good thing. Amen? And, and I like the fact of that. But John 14, 9, Jesus said unto him, talking to Philip. When Philip, he couldn't understand this thing. He said, have I, he, he asked, show us the Father. And when he did that, he said, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He said, He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He said, When you're looking at God, you're looking at me. Yeah. That was a big statement, amen? Because, look, if you ain't got that right, you ain't got nothing right. I deal with a lot of people that uh, they believe that Jesus was a good man. They believe that Jesus was a prophet. They believe, uh, just like we did, that he walked on this earth, but they don't believe he's God. That's what separates us from everybody else. That's real biblical Christianity. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 22, he said, Who is a liar? And I like God's terminology. You don't need no Hebrew and Greek to understand that. He said, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He's talking about the one that denies that Jesus Christ is the anointed Messiah. God himself declared that man to be a liar. And he said, he is antichrist, and if he's not for Christ, he's antichrist. And denieth the Father and the Son. But look here, he said, whosoever. That means anybody you talk to that does this, here's what God said about it. He said, whosoever denieth the Son, being the Messiah, that's what he's talking about, being the uh, direct reflection of God in every way, he said, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. He said, so if you deny that Jesus Christ is God's Son, then you don't have the Father that you proclaim that you have, and that's all the religions of the world. That's pretty straight and pretty plain. Jesus said in John 10, 30, He said, I and my Father are one. So that's why He said He's just like His Father. And I want to talk to you just a little while today, if I can, on Him being just like His Father. Now, my son is not just like me, and that is a good thing in a lot of ways, and I'm being dead serious. That's a good thing. But look, Jesus Christ, just like his father, is omniscient. These thoughts come to my head, and I'm just going to preach them today real fast, and I want you to get a hold of it. But when you're omniscient, that means somebody who literally knows everything. You ever met the guy that thinks he knows everything? Matter of fact, I talk to him sometimes in the mirror. Sometimes I think I know everything. And you walk away thinking that guy thinks he knows everything. I've even had people say, you think you know everything? And I say, I've got a verse on that. <laughs> First John 2, 20, and you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. So I can, King James, uh, definitely stand on the solid rock and say, I know all things. But I don't know all things. Amen? But look here, Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse number 9. He's talking to Israel about them taking their gold and their silver and they're making their own gods and bound down to them. And he said in Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old. That's always a good thing to do. If it worked back then, he's telling them, when you was in the wilderness, it'll work now. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. And all of us can say amen to that. He said, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Now somebody that is omniscient, they know everything. 
Now I want you to notice something the way God uh, worded this verse. He didn't say he was declaring the beginning to the end. He said, I'm declaring the end from the beginning. God already knew what was going to happen in the end before it even happened. That is not Calvinism. That is omniscience, friend. You know why God gave us that word? Uh, when you do that, that means in Psalm 147 and 5, he put it this way, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. That means it's limitless or endless. It's impossible to measure or to calculate. God was saying, look, there's no way you can ever put a measuring stick. Now, there's no way you can ever bottle up all my knowledge. I know more than you will ever know and ever could know. But he said, I declare the end from the beginning. When I read the book of Revelation, people get all tore up about Joe Biden and Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. And you just go back to whoever the Democrat was. That's who they all worry about. Being the Antichrist. And I tell them, look, I didn't read the book of Revelation. We win. God's already told me the end. I'm going to wind up in heaven. I heard a guy one time preaching on that white robe number that no man could number in their white robes. And I thought, I'm already there in the mind of God. And I thought, man, they're shouting praises to God. And before I knew it, I was on my feet. I was practicing a little bit. And I just started praising God and getting warmed up for the day when I stand there in the mind of God already praising his name look here God knows the end from the beginning I heard a guy made a statement one time he said you can't disappoint God he already knows what you're going to do ain't that amazing now I said God I told somebody one time they said God has already seen my end and I said, I hope he sees me finishing well. It keeps me nervous. Amen? But if I don't make it well, I will make it. And I will get to heaven. Amen? I'm going to run through the gate or get drugged through it, but I'm going. Amen? 1 John 3, 20, he said, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. God knows everything about me. You will never know everything about me because I, like you, will tell all the bad stuff I know about you if I ever get mad at you. <laughs> Amen? I raised Rhett when I was raising him. I said, son, and I've heard people going about everybody. And uh, I've done it a time or two myself. And I told him, I said, you always remember, son, there's another side to that story. Let them talk. Don't take their side. Just let them talk. But there's always another side. But can I tell you, Jesus Christ is omniscient. In John 15, 15, now I've got some commentaries and they said they would have put this verse in parentheses, meaning that it was probably added by the translators. I believe it was put there because God wanted us to know it. Amen? Amen. Jesus talking here to his disciples, he said, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. That is a blessing. He said, Everything God told me, I have told you. You ever hear somebody say, God told me this. I'm always interested when I hear somebody say, God told me this. Because I want to know what God told them. And when they tell it, sometimes I think, no, I believe God knows more than that. And if they say something that's in the Bible, I say, yes, I've read that myself. That's all God will ever tell you is what is in the pages of Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. He said, why he is on this earth? He, He didn't tell him, I told you everything that I know. He said, I told you everything that my Father wanted me to tell you. Can I tell you, God gave us a book he told us everything he wants us to know if you want to know what God says to you all you got to do is just open up your Bible and God will speak to you I'm glad he told me everything I need to know while I'm down here and we do have an unction from the Holy One and we do know all things I've read and, and I like this statement 
When we say, I don't know, we condemn our own laziness because we won't open up the Bible and read it ourselves. And I know there's stages to the Christian life, just like from a baby to an old man. There's stages in life and there's things that you learn. But I'm telling you, there's things God has gave some of us that's been walking with Him for years. Hey, God wants us to know that. Sometimes when I'm talking to younger people that has no children, I'd say, look, you might know what the Bible says, and that's good, and you can preach that, and you can believe that, but until you've got one hanging on to your leg, you'll never fully understand all that. I can tell you all about what the Bible says about divorce, but I've never been through it. But I know people that have and all the tragedy of there's a little something personal there amen but I'm glad God Almighty in his omniscience he said everything God told me he said I've told you so if I want to know the answer all I got to do is read the book that's why I ain't nervous about a lot of stuff amen I got a lot of friends I'm telling you from California to uh, from Carolina to California I call somebody within a 50 mile radius and say man I need some help and they come and help me that's good to know that. That's what God's done for me. I've got too many friends to go hungry. I know some people who's got some money. I'd bum it off of them if I needed to. <laughs> Amen? But look here, I've never seen the righteous forsaken their seed begging bread. Right. God, look, I know that. I'm not worried about all these things. I'm not worried about when the M80 goes off in Israel. Is it the beginning of the end? I've done read my Bible and everywhere I've seen Israel, I would highlight it in blue. I don't know what's going to happen to Israel. Amen? There's going to be a new Jerusalem. They are going to be attacked. It is going to look like they're going to lose. But one day, thank God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, with all His army and the host of heaven, they're going to settle it all down. Damn, child, you know that. Doesn't read my Bible. I ain't worried about all that. You are going to make it if you'll just do what this book says. Second Timothy, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he gave us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. He said in verse 10, if you do these things, you shall never fall. So if we fall, we know whose fault it is. Amen, but anyway. You know, Jesus knows what you're thinking. You're thinking ever you think, man, I don't even think that. Now, I'm going to preach about me. You can just jump in here. Sometimes I think, and I think, I need to quit thinking like that. And you always dirty stuff, so get your mind out of the gutter. But look here. Jesus knows what you're thinking. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4, got the withered hand. The Bible said, and Jesus knowing their thoughts, he knows mine. He knows yours right now. Thinking, this guy ain't going to get done 15 after, and you're right. <laughs> and Jesus knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? He knows what you're thinking in your heart. He knows what to think about each other. He knows, he, look here, he knows what Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, he knows the intents of the, and the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'm glad I've got a God that uh, uh, knows what I'm thinking and sometimes he intervenes and says, you need to think different. Sometimes I think that people don't like me. And you know what? They've got other stuff on their mind. They ain't got time to think about me. They've got more important stuff on their mind. There's a lot of things you're thinking, but God knows your evil thoughts. And trust me, the thoughts of man are just like they was in the beginning. Their thoughts are only evil. Continue. You say, how do you know that? Watch TV. Listen to them talk. Read a book. Look how they're acting. Amen. They'll tell you what they're thinking by what they do. I can tell you what you're thinking by what you do. Amen. It just comes out. But look here. Jesus knows what you're going to do. Look, I don't know what I'm going to do here in a little bit. I know I've got plans to go eat with the preacher here in a little bit. That's my plans. And, but uh, the Lord knows what I'm going to do. So he knew I was lying when I would tell you I'd be done 15 after. He said, don't pay no attention to him. I know what he's going to do. Amen? John 13, 36. I want you to look with me, if you will. John chapter 13. I think it's verse number 36. Does this sound like you? You ever make any big promises to God? 
that you broke? And I'd say, guilty. He not only knows what you're thinking. Peter was sitting there listening to him talk about everybody forsaking him. And the whole time, Peter was thinking, no, that ain't me. That ain't me, Lord, that ain't me. But look here, he knew what Peter was going to do. In John 13, 36, he said, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Where thou go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. I like what Jesus said when he said, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? He said it like this, I believe. Will you really lay down your life for my sake, Peter? He knew what Peter was going to do. You ever seen that guy who said, Hey, man, if you do that one more time, I'm what? Yeah, I didn't think he was going to. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. He said, Look, he said, oh, Would you really lay down your life for me? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not the crow to thou hast denied me thrice. He said, you're not only not going to die for me, he said, you're going to deny that you even know me three times to my face. Now I'm going to tell you something, I don't know about you, but sometimes I made some promises. I had forever intention of keeping them. I wanted to keep them. I made efforts to keep them. And for one reason or another, I broke them promises. I couldn't imagine standing in the face of God saying, I don't know who you are. After I'd seen him raise the dead and feed a multitude and heal the sick and I preach all them wonderful sermons and all them accolades when the whole city would come to see him and be right there next to him and say buddy I'm with him he's with me I'm one of his chosen apostles I could not imagine how low Peter felt when he looked him in the face but God knew he was going to do that before he done it that's why I said let not your heart be troubled that's a continuation of the conversation you know what God tells you you're going to blow it some days I know you're going to young or old Rich or poor, smart or unintelligent. He said, you're going to blow it. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, I didn't see the end. He said, Peter, you know what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost? He's talk to him over there. You're going to preach, 3,000 going to get saved. You're going to be back in the spotlight again, son. He said, you're going to do some great things. He said, Peter, there's coming a day when them Jews from James are going to come over there to those saints in Galatia and you're going to get afraid again and you're going to separate yourself from your brothers and sisters in Christ and even though you're telling them to, I don't worry about living like a Jew. When they show up, you're going to tell them, hey, you've got to live like a Jew again. He said, don't worry. I know you're just going to blow it. Amen. You ain't going to go to jail for me tonight, but one day you will. He was so excited about going to jail for Jesus that he got down there and they beat him and they told him, don't preach in that name anymore. And so they left that jail a shouting and praising God, saying, I've been found worthy enough to suffer shame for his name. So through all your faults and your failures, your thoughts and things that just ain't going right and ain't right, just look at the end thing. God sees the end from the beginning. He sees the end of this thing. I mean, when I first got saved, most people didn't say, that's a preacher. When I pastored a church, they said, that's not a pastor. And I said, you're right. And I went down to jail. I got in where I fit in. Amen? But look, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. I think I got these wrote down right. Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 9, he's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what's going to happen. He knows, look here, he knows if you're hurting. He knows if you're happy. But there's people, just, I hear all kinds of stuff constantly. The Lord, no, I don't understand. I, don't, I can't grasp God. This week a preacher back home, his son, 22, bumped a car. Got to check on it. Car hit him after he's coming home from church. Kills him. You know, 23. What are you going to say to a guy like that? I don't know. Do you know what? He's got, he's got the hope of heaven. He's got a Bible. Tends to look, I'm God and I know all things and I know what's for the best. 
God hit him, had 22 DUIs. I don't know if the guy was drunk or not. Amen. The other lady driving the car was a police officer with no lights on her cars at all. I, I can't understand all that. All that gets to one place. But I can tell you this, God knows. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the word of God. That's that Bible you've got in front of you. If you ever read it and it tells you what you're thinking, you read it and you say, that's me. The preacher ever preach and he's preaching the Bible, he said, that's me. That's God revealing your thoughts. But he said, he said, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharp, and then a two-edged sword. It convicts as well as converts. Both ways. Piercing, even it's a piercing book sometimes. It gets down there deep inside you to the divining of son of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God only knows what you think. He knows if you're going to act on what you think. That's foreknowledge, not predestination. I'm telling you, God knows my intentions, and He knows what I'm going to do with my... That's how much God knows about me. He knows more about me than I know myself. God is omniscient. Let me move fast. It's ten after. Jesus Christ is omnipresent. You know, early in my ministry, I said, well, he couldn't be everywhere. But you know what? If you read your Bible long enough, he's everywhere. Yeah, right. Amen? And he got to talk to a fellow over in John chapter 3. Y'all think uh, y'all know who I'm talking about, Nicodemus? You ever hear a preacher preach on Nicodemus? In John chapter 3, and uh, verse number 13. I like this verse. He's told that preacher... Look, you need to get right with God. Again, I tell people all the time, John 3, 16, the first time that sermon was ever preached, it wasn't preached to a prisoner, it was preached to a preacher. And he told him, buddy, I know you're a preacher, and I know you go to church every Saturday, and you teach the Word of God, but you need to get saved. That's why he said, marvel not. He's a bit shocked. Amen? In John chapter 3 and verse number 13, he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You know what he said there? He said, he said he came down from heaven. One of the greatest things that you'll ever realize in this life is that God Himself came to earth. And He came to earth on your behalf. What a blessing it was when I realized that God, on my behalf, He came down to this world. They believed it, uh, friend, they preached it, they taught it. First Timothy 3.16 said, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Jesus Christ meets every bit of that criteria. He said, I came down from earth thank God Almighty he didn't come like that they thought he was going to them Jews was looking for a king they was looking for a kingdom in Acts chapter 1 them disciples he said look they said when are you going to destroy when are you going to uh, bring this kingdom to Israel you know what he told them it's not for you to know right now right. some things God just don't want you to know right now right. amen amen you ever read something and not understand somebody read it and fully understand it and tell you what it means? They see it and you don't? I mean, that's the way it is when you read your Bible. But you know what he told them? He said, don't worry about Israel and the kingdom. Everybody's so interested in prophecy. Prophecy don't affect them. It's stuff that's going to happen on down the road. They want to know who the Antichrist is and they need to concentrate on Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you, if you find out who the Antichrist is, you're in the tribulation you're lost. And you're going to go to hell. He told them, men, don't worry about this kingdom uh, for Israel. Don't worry about me sitting on my father David's throne. He said, go out to the world, to Jerusalem and Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and you tell them about me, you get them saved. Amen. But he told him there, and no man hath ascended up, in verse 13, and to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. 
He said, while I'm standing here talking to you, some people cannot get it. While he's speaking to us now, he's living in my heart, he's living in your heart, and he's with all of us all the time. I can't get a hold of that. But Jesus lives in your heart. You know, I've heard people say, why, well, Jesus don't live in your heart. They want to argue about everything. I said, well, he lives in me. If you read your Bible enough, you'll find that he lives in your heart. Galatians 2.20. Amen. He said, I am, he said I, even I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And, and look here. Look, he said, it's the life that I now live. And let me just say this about that life. I got saved because I wanted a better life. An atheist offers no hope to anybody. The best they'll ever do is America. Could you imagine being an atheist living in Russia or North Korea? I mean, that's all you've got. And when you die, there is nothing. What are you going to tell your kids? Man, life is great. And when you die, it's really going to get good. They have no hope for nothing. Not here or hereafter. I got saved because I wanted a better life. John 10, 10, the thief come and knock over to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Hey, Jesus Christ said, look, it's more than church. Hey, that thief is also, it's a church world. Amen. He said, it's not church, it's Christ. It's not religion, it's a relationship with me. Thank God Almighty, I've enjoyed a good life. I've not just li- uh, existed, I've actually lived. Right. Amen. Right. And when you crucify your flesh, you can enjoy that abundant life. Ephesians 3.17 said that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Right. You know how Jesus moves in your heart? You receive Him by faith. Right. He said, I don't understand all that. Can't do it. Just got, it's why it's called faith. Yeah. You receive Him by faith. I've told this here before about how science believes that whales actually evolved from either pigs or deer. Yeah. I've read it. When I, got the, when I read that, I thought, there's no way somebody could be this stupid. <laughs> they got a Ph.D. in ignorance. The largest mammal in the ocean. When I seen it, I thought, no, I, I researched it even more. In every, every website, every science uh, thing that I read about, where do whales come from? They all said the same thing. A deer or a pig. So the next time you eat bacon, say, man, this whale makes sure he's good. Amen? These people, it's by faith. How do you know in the beginning God created the heaven and earth? Because I've got enough sense to believe that God done it. Not that man evolved. Do you know that a, that a human cell cannot evolve in parts? It's got to have the whole cell at one time. Look, it can't have one part here, and then it evolves into the second or third part. Look here, friend, it all has to be a whole in the beginning, and God done that. God done that. But anyhow, He abides in our hearts. By faith. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. You can read it yourself because it's 17 after and I ain't going to hold you up here. But he talks about this mystery that is in Christ Jesus. He said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He said it was a mystery to them. It's a mystery to others. How can it be in your heart and my heart and be everywhere all the time? I don't know how he does it, but he does. Amen. John, 1 John 3, 24. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. You know how I belong to him? I can feel him stirring around every once in a while. Amen. 1 Corinthians three sixteen said, My body is the temple of God. If God's in here, trust me, you will know it. How do you know? Get doing something you ain't supposed to do or say something you ain't supposed to say in traffic. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one of them dash cams. It even records your voice. I tell people, you get in this car, you better be careful. I'm, I, they can hear every word. 
coming up here. I found myself talking to me. Guy on my bumper. I'm an old man. I drive slow now. And I thought, well, I could swerve over there and just scare him a little bit. And then out loud I said, at 70 miles an hour, that would break me in all kinds of pieces. No way, no way. And I got in the right-hand lane where all old people are supposed to be. And I poke along. But anyway, he abides in us. He's our advocate. He abides in us. First John 2, we have an advocate. My little children, these things write unto you. That you sin not, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's in my heart, and He's in heaven as my advocate. He's in my heart, and I talk to Him when I get things in my life that are not good, and He's not my go between. He's my aid. He's the one that goes between me and God, and He pleads my case. How can He be in here and up there too? I don't know, but I believe it. Amen. Amen. Matthew 28, 20, he said, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world. Now, if he's with me to the end of the world, then he can't be with you. But you say, oh, no, he is. He's everywhere I go. How does he do I don't know. Does this make any sense to y'all? Is it like, That's good, thank you. I need that. This is good because I'm, I'm starting to wonder. Exodus 32, 22. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. When he was out there in the wilderness day and night he kept a canvas of cloud over him to keep him from the sun like in San Diego, California. The reason the weather is always perfect in San Diego there's a marine cloud over that city till about noonday and then it burns off and the sun starts going down. The weather's always perfect in San Diego. That's what he done for them Israelites out there in the desert but at night it gets a little chilly in the desert tell me I don't know I've never been out there in the night. they say it gets real cold God said I'm going to build you a fire that's God the Father out there and God the Father built them a fire and he kept them warm 1 Corinthians 10 4 said that rock that followed them was the Lord Jesus Christ he was in the fire and he was in the cloud he's in my heart and he's beside the Father pleading my case He's in your heart if you're saved, and He's everywhere you go today. I can't figure all that out, but I believe it. Amen? Yeah. You better be careful. God's watching. Let me finish. Jesus is omnipotent. It's 20 after. I ain't lied much. Mine no lie, still a lie. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus told him this. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I don't care who's running North Korea or Russia or China. I don't care if there's a virus running all over the world. And just as a sidebar, quit trying to trace it back where you got it. You got it from Wuhan, China, okay? Solved it for you. There you go. Isaiah 9, 6 said, His name shall be called the Mighty God. He's all mighty Revelation 1 8 I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the ending saith the Lord which is he was before and which was he was here and which is to come thank God the Almighty if he's got all power why should I worry I've had people say what happened to you can I tell you what happened to me there was a God in heaven that done something with me that nobody else could. There was people that tried with all their might. Merrill Haggard sung about it. Mama tried. My mama told me a thousand times, Son, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And I'd sing old Willie songs and wailing songs and sing about Lukenbach, Texas when I went out the door. She hated that song till she died. But old Wayland's still pretty good. Don't listen to him much till God starts bothering me, then I have to turn him. Amen. Still like Luke and Bach, Texas. But anyway. But look here. Something happened to me. My teachers, police officers, 
good friends, good people that tried to help me. Son, you know better, do better. Son, why are you running around them people? And really what I told them, what I told my mother, because I want to. I like them. No, no, they don't make me do nothing. I do everything that I want to do. Do you know how many times I've been told, why do you have to preach so loud? You yell and you got a microphone. I do it because I like it. Amen. I could preach like Brother James Langston, an old friend of mine, 87 years old, two bad knees. He'd grab his britches and say, praise God. Uh, every once in a while, I'd grab his ear and hack a little bit. I could do that, but that's a little much for me. But I love it. Amen. You know what he did? One day, God told me there's something wrong with you. When God told me there's something wrong with me, I realized I got a problem, buddy. You ever cuss and feel bad about it before you got saved? I did. You know what that's called? Conviction. That's not condemnation. That is conviction. That's God saying, You know better than that. You're talking about my name. He said, there's something wrong with you. He told me, hey, your friends are bad friends. You know why somebody's got a bad girlfriend or a bad boyfriend? Because you're bad. Birds of the feather. Amen. The old timers had that right. Look here. All of us need to get rid of some of the people in our life. Get around somebody hateful all the time. You need some new friends. Or you're going to be hateful all the time. Well, look here, I was, I was rotten to the core. I ain't bragging, but I'm just telling you where I was at. And God said, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your friends. There's something about where you go and what you're doing. It ain't right. And you know what? I've done what everybody did when they got to feeling bad about yourself. Honey, I promise I will never hit you again. Baby, I promise I will never drink another drop. God, I'm so sick. And I'll never do that again until you get to feeling better. And she gets to talking again. And your buddies come by and they say, got a cold one and a hot place to go. And you jump right in there. You know why? Because it's in you. Like a whole glove slops on you. Love it. You want to wall her in it. Amen. The one day God said, there's something wrong with you. And I tried to quit it myself. You ever tried to quit cussing? If you're a cusser and somebody make you mad for you, know what you're cussing. Quitting's the easiest thing I've ever done. Staying quit's the hardest thing I've ever done. I need something bigger than me. I need something bigger than AA and NA. I tell them boys in prison, look, if you go to AA and NA, it helps you go. But you just remember, it can't take you to heaven. Over there, you'll always be an alcoholic or a drug addict. Over here at the church, you used to be that stuff. But anyway, John chapter 1. Or John 11, 1, 11. Let me go over here real fast. You ain't going to do nothing but go eat too. He came into his own, and his own received him not. When the Jews rejected him, what a blessing it was to us. We don't want him. We got our church. We got our sacrifice. We got our priest. We're all good here. We got our Bible. And look, can I tell you, there's a lot of good, decent Jews. There's a lot of good, decent Catholic folk. There's a lot of good, decent Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. But that's what they are. They're decent people. They're not saved people. What makes us different? We're saved. Decent and saved. They're good people. That troubles my heart. He said, but to as many as received Him, to them... Give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Thank God there's nobody, no church, no preacher, no program, no appeal that's got that power. God Almighty Himself is the only one that's got the power to transform you from a sinner to a son of God. Amen. Amen. You can read that in First John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Jesus has power to change sinners to saints. I'm St. Larry. I know you don't believe that, but I am. Amen? You read Psalm 16, 3, I believe it is. It talks about the saints on the earth. He said, in whom I delight. 
Ain't that a blessing? One down, a few more to go. Now, she's little. Don't none of the rest ever try that. Amen. But anyway, to them saints on this earth in whom he delights. I believe Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, he said in verse 1, chapter 16, now concerning the collection for the saints. And let me say this little sidebar here. He collected for the saints, the poor saints, not the guy that wouldn't work and pay his own electric bill. Man that won't work, neither should he eat. So don't feel bad if you don't give that guy down there with a sign that says, we'll work for food. Okay, but anyway, give him some money if you want to. Sometimes I do, and a track. But saints, you know what a saint is? The most holy thing. God is omnipotent. God made me one of the most holy things in the world. To that little baby they just carried out, it was crying. Do you know what? That mom and daddy thinks that's the greatest baby in the world. If they didn't, there's something wrong with them people. Amen? Doug and Nanette was up here saying with theirs. They've all done pretty good. They probably think, like my mama said, every, every mom believes her crow's the blackest. I have no idea what that meant. Crows are all black. If you don't think your kid is the smartest kid in the building, you're not a good parent. If you don't brag on your own children over other people's children, there's something wrong with you, buddy. So if he gets you in your hard time, so you ought to be like him, you say, Dad, you're not right, that preacher said so. Huh? But look here. You know what it is? The world looks at us, and you know what they see? They see a bunch of hypocrites, a bunch of losers, a bunch of idiots that are uneducated and don't know nothing, and they believe an old archaic book, and they sing around the manger, and they talk about this Jesus guy all the time. You know what, God, when He looks at us, He says the most holy thing you know when he talks about the gift that God gave to this world one of them was the church can I tell you something I got saved in a church I've been going to church for 43 years can I tell you something I love going to church I'm one of them preachers that if you don't go to church and you say you're saved you ain't going to heaven that's how much of a church preacher I am I know sometimes you're sick and all that. We're talking about if you're, you're able enough and you say you're saved, you ought to be over here. Right. And some of these people get on my nerves too, but I get on theirs. Yeah. So it's all square. Amen? <laughs> but we come here to adore the Lord Jesus Christ. He made us saints. We were sinners, now we're saints. We were sinners, now we're sons of God. Yeah. Can I tell you something? That's a power that only God has. Right. Right. Now I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and word of prayer right fast. Now I'm going to ask you this. Do you know you're saved and going to heaven? Only you can answer that question truthfully. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.